Hello and welcome to the second talk in our series, Embers into Sparks, a series developed through the support of the Tech Embers project. It's a series in which we explore new ideas and developments for the future. And certainly our subject this evening is one where thoughts of the future have often led. The exploration of space and the gradually emerging presence of Scotland in the field. Our speaker is ideally placed to tell us what's happening. Dr. Matyaj Vidmar is lecturer in engineering management at the University of Edinburgh. His background is in physics and in science and technology studies. He's researching innovation processes, strategic alignments and futures design. He focuses especially on the space industry and the new data economy. He leads collaborations of engineers, scientists and artists in developing prototypes and strategies. He leads projects ranging from geostationary space stations to growing food in space. And projects also include several startup companies and public engagement activities. He leads the Scottish branch of the British Interplanetary Society, and he goes on space and astronomy tours around remote and rural parts of Scotland. Also, he is a welcome and much appreciated visitor to Orkney to each year's science festival. So, Matyaj, welcome. And there certainly seems to be something happening in Scotland when it comes to space development. What is it all about? Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and, and good evening, Howie, and, and thank you so much both for uh, inviting me uh, to speak in this very special series, um, as well as generally uh, for, for this lovely introduction uh, tonight. Um, and, and you're right, to go straight to your question and, and something that perhaps many of our listeners and viewers might be interested in, uh, indeed, there's quite a lot going on in Scotland recently in terms of space activities, um, and, you know, in fact, so much so that it's being turned almost as this new space glen, uh, this new place where uh, you know rockets are being talked about, where satellites are being talked about, um, and and there's you know lots of activity really well dispersed across the whole uh, of Scottish mainland as well as um, in the islands as as you all well know. Um, so the core activity, the core space activity in Scotland is, however, still somewhat concentrated in the Scottish Central Belt, in this triangle between Edinburgh, Glasgow and Dundee. Um, in Glasgow, um, there's you know, satellite manufacturing, a lot of sort of hardware development, um, electronics research and communications in, in Dundee, and, and companies are spun out on the back of uh, the work there at the University of Dundee. Um, and then in Edinburgh, a lot of work in terms of data analytics, geoscience, and, and interpreting information we receive from space for various terrestrial applications. Uh, but as you move further north, there's equal amount of um, exciting developments and new opportunities emerging now. Um, first of all, there is, of course, uh, in, in Aberdeen, there is the sort of uh, marine and offshore cluster where satellite industry is supporting uh, the, the various sort of uh, activities in the, in the North Sea. Uh, but further north, um, especially um, in the northern, the northwesternmost coast of Scottish uh, mainland, so in Sutherland, um, as well as in, in Western Isles um, and further afield in Shetland, uh, there have been these proposals for, for building spaceports. And that is something very new. Um, there are, are these sort of special locations uh, that have been identified. I've, I've selected some on the map, but there's actually a few more uh, that have been, have been working towards these, uh, these objectives. Um, right there at the top, uh, you see, uh, you see um, you know, the Shetland, the spaceport in Shetland, uh, Saxaboard uh, Space Centre. Uh, then there is the spaceport Scotland, as I've mentioned in Sutherland, in the sort of northernmost tip. Uh, spaceport One on the Western Isle. Uh, the Western Isles, there's a Marrakanish Space Centre uh, near Campbelltown that actually doesn't have a pin on this particular map, but it's also uh, doing a lot of interesting work. And then there's one a slightly odd one. There's that one down at the bottom, uh, the bottom corner of the map, map there, um, where um, that's that's Prestwick, right? That's the Glasgow Second Airport, if you like. Uh, though to be fair, it's it's much closer to air uh, in 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 um, East Lanarkshire. 
um, sort of North Lanarkshire. Um, well, I'm, I've got my Lanarkshire's myth out, but you know, there, there it is. It's in, it's at Preswick, it's a Preswick Airport, and and so all of these different locations have actually proposed that small rockets can be launched from these sites, um, and they are all at various stages of of development. Um, you know, well, in in particular, a lot of news has been recently released around Shetland. Uh, the Space Tax Awards um, Space Center in, in, in on the island Unst, the northernmost island. So basically they're located on the northernmost tip, on the northernmost island of the northernmost archipelago of the British Isles. And that is, of course, uh, the island of Unst, uh, very, very far tip of, of, of Shetland. And there used to be a radio listening station, a military listening station uh, located there. So there's quite a lot of infrastructure. There's housing. There's roads, there's also, uh, you know, there's of course also lots of um, other kind of transport infrastructure in Shetlands with ports and airports um, to do with oil and gas and other industries. Um, and, and so they're trying to utilize some of the infrastructure that might not be as well, um, as well used in the future as, you know, potentially uh, we vein ourselves off the oil extraction from the North Sea. Um, and they're utilizing this infrastructure to actually uh, now look further afield and, and launch rockets into space. Uh, by the way, just to also kind of clarify immediately, these aren't enormous space centers like, you know, you probably everybody's aware of places like Space Center Kennedy or indeed that uh, famous European Space Agency Space Center in French Guiana. What we are all talking about in terms of designs, you can see here some of the sort of artist draws, drawings and impressions and kind of um, conceptual plans. These are all relatively small launch pads, um, effectively no more than a little slab of concrete or some kind of you know hard ground uh, where you where you prop up your rocket, maybe a launching tower, a small assembly area nearby, and some connecting roads and infrastructure. And, and rockets flying from here are also relatively uh, relatively small, um, you know, especially um, the ones um, kind of launching from uh, from from these from these platforms. You know, they, they're probably, you know, a couple of, um, you know, 10 meters across, something like that, maybe sort of 10 meters in length um, and maybe two, three meters um, around across. Uh, so they're not they're not enormous rockets um, and they don't launch that, you know, huge, uh, huge satellites um, either. And then finally, we've, we've I sort of skirted on Preswick. You can see from this sort of artist impression that Preswick is a little bit different, um, unlike the northern spaceports where the idea is to launch rockets vertically. As you'd imagine, rockets are launched into space. Uh, Preswick, actually, there's a new technology where you can launch an, a rocket from underneath a plane. Um, so, I mean, the military has been doing this for a very long time, but in the civil rocketry, this has really not been done until uh, a few years ago uh, when an American company, Orbital ITK, first, and then Virgin Galactic, a very famous, a much more famous company, uh, has now developed a, a technology to basically strap a rocket underneath a plane, fly it over any part of the world where it's safe to release. And then the plane and the rocket separate and the rocket goes into a launch trajectory. And of course, here, you know, going over towards North Atlantic, you can launch into some synchronous orbits and, and, and you can get access to some of the most um, important sp spaces, if you excuse my pun, uh, going around the Earth, uh, recording data about our environment, uh, supporting telecommunications and other things. So it's, it's quite exciting, actually, all this development. This is fascinating. Um I want to go back into the past. My mind was straying a little because I remembered uh, a story uh, way back in the 1930s about rocket mail in the Western Isles. And there was something else that the Scottish space and astronomy writer Duncan Lunan wrote about as a little boy. I think it was a, a story about a, a rocket launch in the Western Isles for military purposes in the, the 1950s. Can you shed any light on, on these two stories from the past? Absolutely. I mean, so this is the sort of thing, Scotland, you know, we, we talk about Scotland's future today, perhaps, but we're also talking about Scotland's past uh, because Scotland has a very rich history in, in rocketry. Um, indeed, there was this, so the story, the, the one in the 1930s with the rocket mail, uh, is a little bit of a hoax. So this was a this was a, a bit of a trick played by a very inventive entrepreneur who, for a bit of good publicity, uh, claimed that he is going to um, launch the first rocket-powered uh, mail service between two islands uh, in the Western Isles. Um, and basically, what he did is he he he, is, he created he did do some kind of a rocket launch from one end, 
and then some kind of a small explosion on the other island and pretended that he actually extracted a letter out of the out of the out of the out of the wreckage but in fact it was a little bit of a hoax it wasn't actually uh, real because of course this was at the nascent point of of actual profession you know professional rocketry we're talking you know 19 uh, late 1920s early 1930s where um, you know scientists in in the US in particular but also you know famously uh, uh, rocketeers in in Britain as well were establishing the first principles of space flight and rocket flight um, and so they stretched the they stretched the 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 possibility, you know, the 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 art of the possible a little bit, and and created a bit of a nice story. But it did get coverage. It did get coverage in the national newspapers and, and on the radio and so on. So it was quite a, a good a good hoax, uh, but unfortunately not true. However, the second story is very much true. So you mentioned Duncan Lunan, a sort of an eminence of the Scottish space, uh, you know, somebody who's been looking at that for quite quite a while. Um, and actually, yes, as a as a as a little boy, he did. Uh, actually managed to blag his way into the uh, military uh, range in the Western Isles, where they were testing the WAC Corporal missions. You could see in the previous slide, there's actually, uh, those are images of the WAC Corporal, an American mission, uh, American uh, missile. Um, to be fair, it was called a rocket, but it was really more of a missile. It was, it, was, it was part of the sort of nuclear program in the very, very early 1950s. In fact, it's been developed by Frank Molina, another great friend of Scotland, um, and um, and 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 a very um, interesting character in his own right, and a colleague of ours, uh, Fraser McDonald, has listened, recently written a book about him uh, called "The Escape of the Earth with by the Means of a Rocket." So, if anybody's interested, there's a very very interesting story about how this rocket came into being. But, anyways, in 1950s, the UK bought um, a bunch of WAC corporals. By the way, WAC means uh, without altitude control, right? So, it's, it's effectively it's a it's a big fireworks, really, uh, with with just a little bit more guidance than that. Um, and they've bought them, and and they didn't really keep them secret. You can actually see uh, the top picture there. There's actually uh, Wack Corporal uh, exhibited to the public uh, right in front of the Scott Monument on the Princess Street, on top of the just then being built a Princess Street Mall, which is right across from the Edinburgh's train station, Waverley Station, um, and then. They shipped the rocket into the northern, into the Western Isles, uh, to the to the race ranges uh, there in the south west. Um, and you can see the photos there are from those tests uh, when they've when they've put that rocket. The, the bottom two rocket uh, uh, photos are from those tests. And and, and Duncan Lunan, right? He was a, I think he was a six year old boy by then. Um, basically, was so excited when he heard that there's this rocket coming to Scotland and they're going to test it that he went there. He caught a bus or somehow. And then he pretended that he was somehow related to the commander of the base and they let him in and, and he took some photos and he had a really nice day out and, and he saw the, you know, one of the first rocket launches from British soil. Um, and then he went back home um, and apparently Secret Service turned out a few days later wondering what exactly was, his, was he doing and, and, and why did he take, he actually took some photos as well. So it's quite an interesting story. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Scotland has a very, very rich uh, past in terms of in terms of rocketry, and that range on on South East is still used uh, to this day. Um, there is a missile range that is run by you know by a, a, a big defense contractor on behalf of the um, Ministry of Defense, and and this is these are some pictures from a not so recent launch, but one of the recent ones where they recorded the, the rocket has actually escaped the Earth, uh, not quite escaped the Earth's gravity, but escaped the Earth's atmosphere um, and, and broke through what is called the von Kármán line, uh, which is 100 um, kilometers or about you know, 80 miles uh, above, above sea level. And at that point, we believe space starts. That's a kind of a convention where the space starts. And this rocket actually launching from uh, Western Isles went into space in 2015. So um, you know, there's, been, there's been this going on for a very long time. But it's not just rockets, and I think this is very interesting. Um, Scotland also has a very rich uh, tradition in building space equipment, space um, hardware for monitoring space, for doing space experiments. Uh, these are some pictures from the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, where in the 1960s and 70s, they were running a series of experiments on rockets of the type called Skylark. Skylarks were British built rockets that were sounding rockets, so they weren't going necessarily onto an orbital trajectory, so they didn't escape, um, you know, escape into an, into an orbital path around the Earth. They mainly basically went up and came straight back down again. 
Uh, but the Royal Observatory was running a series of experiments where they were looking at the night sky, as you can see it, if you do not have all this air above us, right? So they basically launched a camera on a rocket and as it pierced through the atmosphere, it took some photos when it was out there and then it came back down and they could actually look at those images and, and, and then understand more about our universe. Now, I'm afraid to say that most of those experiments didn't actually quite work out. The cameras were notoriously fiddly to actually get to work and, and lots of times they were either taking photos of the earth or not taking photos at all. Um, and some of the experiments also exploded, but we still have actually some hardware from those experiments at the Royal Observatory. And there were definitely um, quite, a, quite a milestone in, in space exploration. Of course, soon thereafter, so we're talking about, you know, 60s, 70s, soon thereafter, astronomy moved to satellites, much more stable platforms. So actually, uh, from then on, uh, you know, the Scottish astronomers and, and Scottish um, engineers were very much involved in the development of a whole series of satellites. Uh, they are looking out into the night skies and collecting information about the universe, as well as those looking down on, down on Earth. But perhaps those on looking out are always a little bit more mysterious and a little bit more special. And um, so as an example, there's, of course, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, which was recently launched um, just last Christmas, really, um, and is now in, in moving in position into its, into its spot around the Lagrangian orbit um, to look at the, at, the, at the night skies in its full glory, right? Away from the sun um, and far above the Earth and far away from, uh, from, from, the, from the atmosphere. Um, and one of the three main instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope was actually partially designed and built here in Edinburgh. Uh, led by uh, Gillian Wright, the director of the Royal Observatory. So, you know, it, again, Edinburgh Scottish scientists are very much at the forefront of, of science and, and space exploration. And, you know, so whilst we talk about a lot of this space industry as being a new phenomena, in fact, it has a very long tradition, very long history, and it's grounded in Scottish engineering legacy um, and, 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 that sort of, and that sort of culture, if you like, uh, of exploration that, uh, that the Scottish astronomy community and space community are known for. And indeed, in that connection, I was just thinking about the transition in Glasgow. Once upon a time, the world's great ships were Clyde built, but now we're getting satellites that are built in that very, very area. And I'd even heard it said that there are more satellites built in Glasgow than in any other city outside the USA. Is that a, an exaggeration or is there something in that? That's absolutely true, Howie. Yes, indeed. Mm. Um, the, the Glasgow space industry is soaring high. Now, of course, again, there's a little caveat, and the caveat is these are much smaller satellites than the ones that you know people usually imagine when they talk about sort of geostationary satellites for telecommunication, for your Sky TV, for the you know for the broadcasting, um, or indeed for 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 the kind of you know GPS, you know time coordination from you know this very orbit is very high up. <clears throat> satellites need to be very resilient, have to carry uh, significant power sources, etc. Um, but in Glasgow and across Scotland, actually, there has been an emergence of a different kind of satellite. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's actually been this development of what you might refer to as a suitcase satellite <clears throat> or a cube satellite. So satellites that are about the size of a suitcase, they're relatively small. Um, and, and, and there's various bits and bobs built across the whole of the Scottish value chain. So on the previous slide, you could actually see all the components need to go into building a satellite, a small satellite like this. So on one hand, you know, in, in Glasgow and in, I mentioned also Dundee, people are designing and building components and, and, and buses for these satellites. So basically these are the frames in which you put electronics um, and, and various sort of avionics and, and the solar cells and the power banks. And, you know, and in, the, in many ways, you know, a modern day satellite is not that much different than a modern day smartphone, right? You have your camera, you have your battery, you have some kind of a processing engine, of course, telecommunications, right? The ability to actually send signals over a, a distance of period and time. So with the electronics getting smaller and smaller and smaller, satellites can get smaller and smaller and smaller. And Scotland, being a relatively small player in the big space industry, has actually found this niche that it can actually contribute very meaningfully to the production of these small satellites uh, that are being used for a variety of purposes. And the idea is that really, you know, Scotland is becomes this sort of one stop shop. I mean, this is UQ1, which sort of transformed Scottish space industry. Um, it was a project led by the UK Space Agency. And though it is a UQ, right? So it's a it's a it's a UK 
is the first U cube, U, U, uh, it's the first UK CubeSat. So Cube satellites are these satellites that are built effectively almost like a Lego from a cubes of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters wide, right? This is a three unit cube satellite because actually a single unit you cannot really squeeze that much into. But if you add three units, so you have 30 centimeters and then 10 by 10, then that's about that's about the size that you can actually pack some serious punch in there. Um, and so this was the first one. It was built by a, um, a company uh, in Glasgow called um, Clyde Space, now AAC Clyde Space, uh, with part in partnership with uh, Bright Ascension and Dundee Electronics and, and, and Hardware Controls Company. Um, and there's <clears throat> others that are kind of emerging in this space as well. There's another company called Spire in Glasgow making satellites. There is Alba Orbital making satellites that are even smaller than this one. This one called Pocket Cubes because they're actually even a fraction of the size of these satellites. So there's a lot of interesting development uh, over in, in, in Glasgow. Um, it's not just um, you know, the suitcase satellites, right? If you think about these smaller satellites, well, they also need smaller rockets to be launched into space, or rather they don't require as big rockets as past, uh, you know, as past satellites require. And so a, a couple of companies have sprung up. They're actually developing new rockets here in Scotland. So Skyrora, for instance, is perhaps the most famous one um, because it's, it's recently done some really high profile tests and done a lot of research. It's based in Edinburgh, but it's actually got um, other sort of uh, affiliated uh, factories and research centers in other places in Scotland, as well as overseas, including um, in Ukraine. Actually, Scotland has a strong uh, connection with Ukraine in the space industry. Several of our leading companies have either factories there or key staff that come from Ukraine. So this is a very difficult time for them. But nonetheless, Scarora is soaring high, as they like to say. Um, and they've, they've basically designed a, a launch engine um, and, a, and, a, and a body that is able to carry uh, a couple of tens to up, up to about 100 kilograms of, of payload into orbit, right? So we're not talking about car size things. We are talking about, let's say, a bunch of suitcases, but nonetheless, very, very critical and these are exactly the sort of rockets that we can launch from this uh, launch pads in the north of Scotland. So very, very interesting uh, development there. So by the way, I mean, they've, they've repurposed some old quarries to do some rocket tests. So Scotland really is turning into this sort of science fiction land where, you know, you might be walking your dog one day and you hear some strange noises, noises coming out of a quarry. But it might well be that that's actually a rocket test because a lot of this research is happening in our industrial estate. As you mentioned, the Clyde, of course, but then also um, in places like Newton Grange, Lone Head here, sort of south of Edinburgh, you know, places that used to be industrial centers, uh, but have lost that um, have lost that industry in the in the past decades, and now space is returning and and, and bringing some of that engineering back to back to some of the Scottish Scottish towns and and communities. And in addition now to, to satellites and rockets, <clears throat> there seems to be a number of companies involved in data in the field, handling artificial intelligence for data analysis, handing, handling data itself as something of value. And I wonder what, what's the extent of this and what we can expect? No, and indeed, Harry, and in many ways, actually, data... Uh, whilst, you know, everything that's come so far, engineering has perhaps had more visibility because, you know, rockets are very cool right and people like looking at rocket launches and they are very very impressive and they do inspire in us that sort of um, you know mythology of reaching beyond what we are you know able to to reach within our sort of human lives but actually in many ways that the big the big driver of scottish space industry is actually data um, and <clears throat> people like steve lee here the ceo of, of a company called astrosat um, are kind of driving that by having this you know this motors i mean his motto is Every problem has a space solution. What he really means is every problem has a space data solution. You can actually find out something more about life on Earth or some kind of natural environmental problem or other features of, of, of human behavior or indeed uh, natural processes by looking at them from space. And, and, and companies like, uh, like Astrosat have been actually developing various sort of, um, the various sort of solutions. Um, basically, they are developed in Scotland, but they serve also global uh, needs, not just the local ones. So, for instance, you know, there's been projects about mapping forests. There's a company called Carbomap that's developed really accurate forest mapping from, from space, um, as well as using sort of um, pilotless planes, you know, drones and things like that. Um, and, you know, Astrosat themselves, I mean, there's, you know, there's various kinds of platform people are developing. And these days they're tracking, I mean, all sorts of things like, you know, large animals, in nature reserves to prevent poaching, or indeed 
I mentioned forestry. I mean, on one hand, you can track forests in order to manage them, but also to protect them, because of course, we know that illegal forestry, particularly in places like the Amazon, are one of the reasons why you know, the Amazon is so threatened and is not able to um, actually produce as much oxygen and capture as much carbon as it used to be uh, able to. <clears throat> and there's other things as well. You can track level of economic development from space by being, you know, counting cars on streets. You're able to tell whether people are, you know, how, you know, how, what is the average income uh, bracket for a, for a particular uh, for a particular group of people, you can you can track energy consumption. I mean, this is perhaps one of the obvious ones, right? Everyone's seen those pictures of the Earth. In fact, one is just behind me. There's a picture of the Earth, you know, at night, and you can see all those bright lights, the bright dots there, which are of course big cities. Um, and you can sort of see that's you know that, that's that's a measure of development. That's energy consumption. Um, you can even track whether your buildings are well insulated or not, whether heat is escaping from buildings through roofs and windows. And of course, in the UK, we have a notoriously bad insulated um, you know, cities and towns, and you can actually measure if you know, various um, interventions that are introduced by the government um, and other sort of charities and other organizations are actually helping contain more heat and, and actually reduce our carbon footprint. So there's a vast amount of different kinds of things that you can actually track and trace. And I say, a lot of them have an origin in Scotland. Scotland is a kind of a perfect test bed, if you like. I've actually done some research about this, and you know, there's this sort of idea of a living lab, right? A laboratory that's actually everywhere around us, right? And these sort of living labs are made out of these sort of different kind of categories. There'll be some green ticks appearing as as we click through this slide, and you know, there's like, um, you know, if you think about it, what you actually need to test out these sort of environmental tracking solutions. Well, a you need diverse natural environment, right? You need the stuff that you're trying to track. Then you need the physical and digital infrastructure so that your sensors and your, you know, your scientists are actually able to communicate what's happening in the environment to, um, you know, to whatever that data is being collected and processed. You need those scientists and research capabilities. You also need people that engage with these experiments. We've run some very big experiments in Scotland or we've been part of them uh, in citizen sensing, citizen science. So you know, people planting little sensors in their gardens so that they're able to detect how well their garden is performing and things like that. Counting trees, mapping bike routes. There's all these interesting things people can actually do. And there's an actual advantage in being small. Actually, Scotland is great for that because in a big country, it's very difficult to have that coherence and that kind of, you know, a, 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 a understanding of who the local stakeholders are and how to get everybody that's relevant for a project together to work towards these sorts of innovative solutions. And so actually here, Scottish relative small size is a big advantage. And there's, a more, there's some more green ticks that are going to match this against Scotland. Scotland ticks all these boxes, as you can see, um, and especially for tackling things like the climate change, you know, and all this environmental monitoring. You know, Scotland has diverse coastline, it has seas, it has forests, it has rivers, you know, all of this richness of natural environment is actually a test bed where we can develop solutions that help revolutionize the way we think about the world and also hopefully a way to better look after the world, of course, which is the objective with sustainable development goals and, and all these sort of things. Can I ask you a, a bit more about this, this concept <clears throat> of, of a living lab and projects and how they actually develop? How do people bring all the elements together to, to create this kind of development project? Yeah, well, see, that's the hard bit, of course. That is, of course, the, you know, the devil is always in the details and this is the detail, right? Um, you know, We've, we've, you know, through all the research we've ever done, we basically figured out that actually these networks of companies, research organizations, academia, you know, government, sometimes local authorities are held together by innovation intermediaries, right? So yes, you need the companies and you need entrepreneurs and you need that critical mass of people who are engaging with a topic, with an area, but you also need people who actually know everybody, right? Who are integrators. Uh, this is from, you know, these pictures here are a, a network, map of, network map of the Scottish space industry that I've done. This is a little bit out of date now. It's a few years ago. Uh, but basically, I've, I've done some mapping and I've, I've spoken to companies in the Scottish space industry. And I tried to figure out who are the most well-connected people in the Scottish space industry. And yes, some of the lead companies will have very big networks of suppliers and, 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 um, and of course, also partners in, in their project. But actually, the ones that seem to have had kind of this a very strong kind of connection to everybody in the middle are these innovation intermediaries, research centers, universities, 
um, you know, in innovation agencies, community developers, you know, various kinds of people. Of course, in, in the case of space, these are kind of highly specialized, highly technical, uh, prof you know, professional, uh, professional organizations. They're not necessarily community developers. But actually, we've been modeling this also in the creative industries recently. And, you know, if you look at the community development, and it's always those developers at the center of the net. You know, people a little bit like Mr. Howie Firth over there, right, who has been a, a, a bastion of the community, the, the, you know, in, in Orkney, where developing a whole series of different kind of science projects, arts projects, you know, cultural projects, and, you know, knowing everybody and trying to intermediate, right, that's what they call the innovation intermediaries, um, doing various kinds of things, right, and, and, and this can vary, right, sometimes what is needed, this is a, a bit of, of, of development we've, we've done in terms of trying to map out what do these intermediaries actually do? How do they get these people in? How do they become at the center of the net? And it really varies. <clears throat> Sometimes what you need to do is provide space, you know, infrastructure, office spaces, meeting spaces, knowledge, right? Just the ability to actually give people the resources to innovate is, is a critical factor. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a critical position and a critical role that innovation intermediary can can play and some do that and not all of them do because you don't have to do everything but you know it's a very very important role sometimes the important role is to provide spaces to meet conferences you know <laughs> events write reports you know frame that you know public discourse around an emerging area of technology a lot of different kinds of um, um sort of conferences and events have been set up in the past few years in the space industry in scotland by a variety of these sort of intermediaries um, you know from there's this dot, data dot space the picture up there in the, in the top right corner is from data dot space conference which is organized in glasgow for a few years by the um scottish um scottish center of excellence in satellite applications for instance which is part of the catapult network and sometimes you need to kind of roll up your sleeves and get, get your hands dirty, right? So at the bottom corner there, we have another picture of that U-Cube satellite that I showed you earlier, right? That sort of pocket cube satellite, right? Well, that, that's the, that was one of the first satellites built in Scotland. And there was quite a lot of involvement from the UK Space Agency. Um, and, and, you know, the UK Space Agency as a, as a national space agency is a, is a development intermediary as well. And they've provided or they've contracted project management and support and the funding. And they've gathered everybody together to work on one single project. And thus created a critical mass and established relationship between different companies to actually move on and set up their manufacturing value chain so that satellites now roll up. And as, as how you absolutely correctly said, these days, Glasgow makes more satellites than any place outside of the US. I mean, how fascinatingly amazing is that? But it sometimes, you know, there's always the sort of thing with a, with a well, right? If you have one of those pumping wells, you need to first slip some water in to kind of, you know, oil the, oil the machinery before you can actually drag some, you know, before the, before the seal holds and you can actually pump some water out. So sometimes projects like that are, are actually uh, very, very um, Im important. Um, so, yeah, and in fact, we are now setting new ones, right? So, you know, we've, we've, we've just been looking at, at two new intermediaries in the Scottish space sector sort of recently. Um, the one that's that's already built is already there. It, it already has a program. It's something called the Higgs Center for Innovation, with whom I've worked very, very closely for a number of years, setting out their programs. And they are based at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. They're part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council in partnership with the University in Edinburgh. And they are providing office space and business incubation support. So that's basically support for small companies to let them grow and, and, and develop quickly, uh, as well as innovation facilities. So test, test beds, you know, vibration tables where you can put your small satellite and shake it until it breaks apart. And so you know that your satellite is robust and is going to survive a rocket launch into space. Optical benches where you can assemble cameras and other components. Um, and, you know, design suites as well. You know, they have a beautiful wall where they can actually do concurrent design. So you can connect with your friends all around the world um, and open up this um, enormous, effectively, blackboard, if you like, where everybody's desktop is shown and you can actually move objects and move ideas between different people very easily, uh, powered by a very strong server behind all that. So, you know, it's very, very impressive stuff there. Um, and at the University of Edinburgh, you mentioned that, Harry, when you did the introduction, I believe, uh, we are also setting up a sort of a, 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 another intermediary, another slightly different program. We don't have necessarily facilities and spaces. We are all about trying to get our research at the university to be more closely aligned with what the Scottish space industry uh, needs are and support them in the next growth phase. Sometimes, you know, necessarily, don't necessarily quote me that, but sometimes I say that actually a lot of the things that the Scottish space industry has been doing so far is 
advanced in terms of system engineering, but individual components have so much more potential. And, and we are hoping that actually by working, you know, universities teaming up with various companies, we can expand on what these companies are able to deliver for various customers um, and do so much more uh, than we were able to do so far. So this is Space Innovation Hub based at the University of Edinburgh, part of this slightly elusive data-driven innovation program. Um, you've mentioned before how you know, data seems to be that kind of, the data processing seems to be that kind of unique thing. And in Edinburgh, we have this absolutely fascinating center for AI. I mean, we've been one of the first universities in the world to set up a research center in AI. Um, and as part of this data-driven innovation program, which is a big investment uh, across the university, we are developing all sorts of new solutions that come from being able to handle big data and do data analytics with AI and without AI. But space, of course, being a huge producer of data, right? I mean, if you think about satellite images, they're covering the whole of the world. So that's a huge amount of, of data. Uh, you actually need that super advanced processing capability. So Edinburgh has a very important uh, role to play. We're setting up something called the data slipstream, where we're bringing together different bits of space data so that uh, companies and other users can come along and, and, and try and test, like a little virtual playground that can try and test various ways to analyze what satellites are seeing and what does it actually mean on the ground and does generate more value, more information, more insight about our planet. So we have this emerging sector with companies, manufacturing companies, developing software, analyzing data, researchers, centers, innovative centers to bring them all together. What about some of the specific projects that, that are emerging? Yeah, I'll, I'll men I maybe mention some of the things that are really big and really shiny and really exciting. Um, and and you know, to maybe also move a little bit further afield. We talked a lot about satellites these today. We talked a lot about sort of the Scottish space industry and launching of rockets, but I kind of hinted at other things as well, like the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb Space Telescope went out into space on a much, much larger rocket than what is actually being launched from Scotland. And yet Scotland is playing a significant part. And of course the big goals at the moment, if you if you watch the news in, in space industry are you know going back to the moon and then the first approach to Mars. And actually, right now, there is a robot, a NASA robot called Valkyrie, that's being, well, it's basically learning how to walk and how to grab things and how to do things um, in, in Edinburgh. Uh, it's, it's hosted at the University of Edinburgh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a robot. And in fact, it's not actually, university, it's not, does not belong to the University of Edinburgh. It's on loan from NASA because it's such advanced technology that they're not allowed to sell it to anyone outside of the U.S., um, so it's a humanoid robot, and 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 this is the team um, that you can see there on the top at the Robotarium, the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics, which is a joint project between the University of Edinburgh and the University of Heriot Watt in Edinburgh, um, working together on on many different kinds of rovers and robots, and 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 a lot of the stuff that they do is in sort of biomedical robotics. But amongst other things, they're also teaching this robot to walk um, and to grab and to do things like that. So. Isn't I mean that's a that's a fascinating project right at the forefront of 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 the of what science is actually able to do. But it, there's also sorts of other things as well. We, unfortunately, I'm I'm noticing the time, so we can't really cover them all. But I'll mention a few. We have a project at the UK Centre for Astrobiology where they're looking at how you can use microbes to mine minerals out of space rocks, and they've actually flown uh, this experiment on the on the International Space Station, and it's called BioRock. Um, and the astronauts have been, and actually been very successful experiments and they've proven that actually you can use microbes to mine, uh, mine minerals of, of, of rocks. Um, so that's kind of super exciting. You know, I myself, you know, I'm involved in, in kind of other conceptual design projects as well. Some of them are to do with interpreting AI and data, but I also run, I think you've mentioned this when you did your introduction, I also run a, a little side project that's about a geostationary space station. Just to be absolutely clear, we're not running a geostationary space station. We're just thinking about one, especially what would it mean to actually go into space in a slightly more considerate kind of human paced way? Um, you know, if you look at what the moon race did, right, when, when you know, there's this sort of big dash to the moon, huge rockets, you know, effectively bigger and bigger rockets with very, very much um, one single objective to place a person, a human onto the surface of the moon. Um, but actually, we believe that the future of space exploration is perhaps a little bit more considerate rather than going with more big rockets, even bigger ones that are now able to push you uh, all the way out towards Mars. How about we start thinking about railroads? How about we start thinking about infrastructure with stages 
to go to places like the moon or Mars. So the geostationary space station is a concept, it's an idea where we are doing little bits of research to try and at least make some noise and, and, and make some awareness of the fact that, well, hang on a minute, do we really need to think about these as single shot missions, right? Build a big rocket, go there, come back, job done. Shouldn't we rather think about, well, let's take a reusable rocket to low Earth orbit. Let's take an electric propulsion vehicle between low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit. And then once you're in geostationary, let's use some of the space junk to, big, to build spacecraft, both probes as well as things that we can use for human travel to go further beyond. So rather than just you know, chucking more stuff out there, almost you know, willy-nilly inconsiderately, how about we make a little bit more of an effort to think more sustainably and, and more in, in sort of steps rather than just looking and fixating on that final goal? And I think here, I think there's this Edinburgh tradition of interdisciplinary research that comes into its fore. And I think it's, it's kind of super important to sort of highlight um, because, you know, there, you know this, we've done some interesting projects as to how do you look at space exploration from cultural perspective, especially to make sure that we do not repeat the mistakes um, we've made in the past. So if we're driving for more sustainability, let's have a think about what this sort of mini space race that Scotland is partaking in actually is doing for the environment. And, and, and uh, you know, are there, are there some bits of history that are repeating themselves? So um, on the next slide, there's actually quite a beautiful uh, painting by Sarah Julia Campbell um, that illustrates a short story that we've commissioned from Pippa Goldschmidt, a great friend of mine, and I know a great friend of yours as well, Howie, uh, who wrote this lovely story, story called Welcome to Planet Alba, uh, which is about, I'm not going to give away all the spoilers, uh, you know, but it's, it's about a, a visitor center in the Scottish Highlands where they are doing this sort of virtual reality experiences of Mars. Um, but the newbie, the newcomer into the visitor center actually reflects a lot on that sort of idea of emptiness, idea of sort of digital spaces, idea of virtual spaces and what they hide and what sort of stories of, of exploration, but also exploitation are, are coexisting in parallel, of course, in the in the highlands, especially if we're talking to places like Sutherland, etc. Um, there is there's a very specific history of highland clearances and ways in which you know people and and livelihoods and 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 communities had to make way in in the name of progress and in the name of new technology, in the name of 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 more and more uh, you know these sort of single shot missions, these sort of objectives of targets of getting more sheep, more cows, more this, more that, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll let you, I'll let you, you know, if 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 listeners and viewers would like to um, go and, and read more of this story, I, I will not, you know, spoil more fun. Uh, but it's it's part of a book actually that we've we've recently published through a, a, a group called Shoreline of Infinity, which is a um, which is a premier Scottish premier science fiction magazine and publishing house. Um, and it's an interesting book because it actually combines short stories with academic perspectives. So this is part of something called the uh, Social Dimensions of Outer Space Network. It's a network of academics across Scottish universities. Um, and we've commissioned three short stories that were developed in conversation, much like the one we have uh, tonight, uh, between an, an artist, so a, a, a writer, um, and a, a, a scientist, a, a researcher, astronomer mainly, um, as well as a social scientist, somebody from literature or from uh, from, from politics, or indeed, like myself, from innovation, actually, I, I was involved in this project as well. Um, and, you know, the stories are all about, you know, we talked about, you know, Scotland into space. This book is already there, Scotland in space. So this is a very good spot for probably, probably to stop. But their stories as varied as about how we're going to generate some kind of infinity drive that's going to produce Scottish independence intergalactic style, uh, proper physical, you know, beaming on the other side of the galaxy, or indeed, what would a fringe festival look like if it was happening or if it was um, sort of commissioned by some extraterrestrial on on a on a on a on an exoplanet, a planet going around another star? So there you go. So there's quite a lot of interesting futures for Scotland in space. But I think as this talk sort of demonstrate, Scotland isn't going into space. Scotland is already there. These are fascinating images, Matthias. While we've been speaking, questions have been coming in. And Bill Graham asks about the CubeSats you mentioned. Bill says, are these very many CubeSats launched into low orbits for eventual natural re-entry, or will they just add to space junk in permanent orbit? That's a, that's a very good question. And um, indeed, they are. They are. Uh, they are destined for an for a natural reentry. 
And when we say eventual, particularly the ones that are in the lower Earth orbits, that eventuality is actually not very long. Uh, it's, it's usually satellites, these sort of small satellites are projected to last somewhere between 18 months to maybe three, four years. Um, so it's a really relatively short time span. Um, they are relatively cheap to make and they do completely burn on re-entry. So they are relatively, um, you know, kind of, there's a different paradigm as to how you make a new satellite. So basically the idea is that they're so cheap to make and they are so, um, you know, so, you know, environmentally you can be kind of, you know, uh, degraded. Um, the replacing them is better than trying to save them and repair them and build them from longer. The challenge we're having is not in the lower Earth orbit. The challenges we're having are further higher up where satellites, big or small, it doesn't really matter, are actually having hundreds, you know, further up even thousands of years before they would naturally re-enter into the Earth's environment. And if any of these satellites were to crash into each other, scattering debris around, and that debris were to damage more satellites, which would lead to even more debris, we end up with this thing called the Kessler effect, right? Where effectively there's a cloud of debris spanning all around the Earth, and then we cannot relaunch any rockets to anywhere beyond that orbit. And it's, it's, it's effectively a sort of a lock-in syndrome for the Earth, um, and a very, really, a very real and a very scary prospect for many satellite operators. So that's really where the big challenge is. These smaller ones, particularly the ones lower, lower down, are not the big issue, but up there, yes, absolutely. And that's exactly why, you know, things like Gateway Earth is trying to push some new ideas out there. Let's not, because the other thing that, you know, satellites are, you know, do, or, or, you know, it's done to satellites is that they're moved out of the way. So especially in geostationary orbits, geostationary orbits are very valuable. And if you're in a particular spot, that means you're able to broadcast a particular area on the earth. And so these are actually allocated through international telecommunications union. And there's kind of quite strict regimes with countries and, and, and companies sort of bidding for these slots. And it's, it's quite complicated. And so when a satellite is no longer in use, that valuable slot needs to be vacated. So they basically push them in what we refer to as a graveyard orbit. They kind of are pushed up and sideways into a spot of space where they basically just keep on orbiting around the earth without any purpose. That's tons and tons and tons of proper space junk, which is just sitting there. And it's still a potential risk because there could be perturbations due to meteorite impacts or other things that actually would move things in such a way that it would potentially endanger things that are useful. And as I say, there's, you know, I mean, locking syndrome in gestation is more difficult to get to, but never, you know, these are details. Um, so the idea is to, rather than actually thinking, well, okay, we, everything needs to come right back down to earth. How about we build infrastructure in space to kind of use these as raw materials as we go further into space exploration, rather than effectively relifting all of the material, all of this iron and, and other things. Because in the end, these are all, you know, iron, silicates, you know, all the things that are, are used for making chips and things. Um, rather than actually lifting all the way back from the earth, why not use the ones that are already there and are at the moment basically space waste? We have a question about fossil fuel burning. The questioner says we're told we shouldn't burn fossil fuels in our cars, in our aircraft, because burning fossil fuels produces greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases produce climate change. So the speaker asks, in terms of climate change, is the space industry and its burning of fossil fuels in rockets a plus or a minus? Well, that's a very, very good point. I, I mean, I, I won't, I, I cannot speak on behalf of the space industry. I'm an academic, I'm a researcher here, and, and I can, I, I, I put merit in both sides of the argument, but I'll just explain maybe some of the things that are happening locally here in Scotland to address that particular issue, because it is a big issue. And, and you know, the Scottish space strategy actually has especially written in a, a clause about trying to be as sustainable as possible. And there is at the moment a space, a specific, um, sustainability strategy for space that's been uh, prepared by our colleagues at Astro Agency in partnership with the Scottish government, the Scottish enterprise. So there's a lot of work uh, being done in this area. But to long story short, um, there is now, uh, you know, company, the Skyrora I mentioned previously building rockets uh, here in Edinburgh. Um, they are investing a lot of research into ecozine, an ecological fuel that's actually made from recycled plastic. So this isn't new carbon being released into the environment, new sort of, you know, kerosene or any of the derivatives of, of petrol, uh, but actually it is, it is a re recycled plastic that gets burnt up. And, and, and yes, it does release some carbon, but it's, it's, it's actually um, not, uh, not taking more carbon out of the ground, it's using a resource that's already, it's already there. Um, 
And in general, I mean, a, a single rocket, you know, rockets, you know, as, as, as exciting each and individual one is, rockets are actually still quite rare and, you know, few and fair in between. Uh, even the ones launching from, you know, I mentioned all these locations in the north of Scotland. I mean, each of these sites is probably going to be launching no more than, a, you know, a couple of dozen rockets per year. And, 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 and in comparison, that's actually not as much um, as much um, carbon dioxide as some, some, some people's commutes, right, daily commutes. Um, with a with a with a with a with a with a diesel car or something like that. So there there's a lot of nuance there, but it's absolutely the case that, that the space industry needs to address the issue of sustainability. There is a little extra plus, though, right? Because vast majority of these satellites are being launched out there to look back down on the Earth and to support our understanding of the environment and our increasing care for the environment. So from that point of view, we do need that information, and without that information, in fact. You know, it's, it's very interesting because I think there's a few, a few a few days ago there's been an anniversary of a very famous, uh, teeny tiny these days these are very famous, but otherwise teeny tiny um, little news uh, news snippet uh, from 1912 I think uh, where somebody wrote in a in a newspaper about you know there was one of the first results about climate change somebody did a bit of math as to how much coal is being burned and what an effect of release of that much carbon dioxide would have on the environment. And, and the fact that effectively the Earth's blanket is getting thicker, um, which is you know one of those early forewarnings of climate change, right? But until we were able to really demonstrate that with hard data, and even today, unfortunately, some people don't believe in it. But you know, uh, you know, until the 1980s, 1990s, where this sort of global scale climate data became available, by and large, not exclusively so, but by and large, also with the help of satellites, we were not really taking climate change seriously. Um, and so that sort of, you know, we, we, we will have to make some trades off even in the future where perhaps spending some of our carbon stock in order to have better understanding of what's going on with our planet is still necessary. But as I say, I'm, 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 I'm neither here nor there on this. And absolutely, I think it's important that the space industry very much places sustainability as much as is possible uh, right at the center of its mission. That's what I meant when I said, you know, going to Gateway Earth, right? Rather than launching big rockets that spend a lot of fuel, you only need to launch a rocket into the low Earth orbit. From then on, you use electric propulsion, you use, you know, various kinds of other things that you can actually get um, some, at least some, if not all of the cargo um, and, and material um, into, into positions in space that people would like to explore and, and are useful, uh, both for understanding our own planet as well as our place in the universe. Now, a question about spaceports, because you, you showed on the map the, the sites of spaceports in Unst in northwest Sutherland, the potential there, yeah. Unst, northwest Sutherland, the Western Isles, Prestwick. And you also mentioned that a spaceport, essentially, at its very simplest, is a, a mat of concrete on which a, yeah. a rocket stands to launch. Is that the fate of of them to be just that, or could there be um, could they be a, a kind of nucleus around which various industries grow in the course of time? Absolutely, and and these various industries, not all of them actually are in technology and engineering, right? So uh, first of all, absolutely, uh, you know, I think all of these spaceports are aiming to develop centers of local industry, and 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 you know and. Um, whilst their basic principles are simple, the logistics operations, controlling the range, you know, uh, making sure that you know there is there is often a a a, a maritime component to the spaceport operations because all of these are located on the coast. So there's there's maritime security um, and and monitoring and also retrieval of rockets, you know, of, of spent rocket bodies and things like that. There is um, ground management, land management. Um, and there's, of course, tourism. Uh, rockets are big magnets for people to come and, and visit. Uh, so many of these places are already preparing various sort of programs. I'm actually involved a little bit uh, in the plans they're having up in the Shetland, uh, where they are already developing a whole community program, both in terms of education, uh, preparing the young people in Shetland for some of the opportunities that the, sport, sport, the space sport might bring, as well as developing some community knowledge around sort of wild skies, right? How do we you know, just looking at the night skies and some of that sort of cultural astronomical aspect around space exploration are kind of coming along as well. So absolutely, there's a there's a whole, whole range of industries and, and development that is happening to this place. And, 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 you know, let's be frank, you know, one of the reasons why Scottish government, Scottish uh, development agencies, and of course, also UK government are investing in this space is to support 
um, the these remote communities in the development of, of technology uh, that is is both helpful locally as well as of strategic importance for the Scottish space industry and and the UK and Europe as a whole. Of course, we mustn't forget. You know, we are very much. You know, this is the idea is that these spaceports aren't just some kind of Scottish re, um, um, resource. They are European gateway into low Earth orbit, sun synchronous orbit. So these, unlike um, you know, a lot of people talk about like when you think about launch a satellite, you think about you'll need to go to the equator because that's the that's the best way to get all the way up to the geostationary orbit where all the big satellites sit. Well, but these little ones that we were talking about, this pocket, you know, cube sized, you know, um, suitcase. Uh, uh, suitcase size satellites, they are not going that high up. As we said, they deorbit after a few years and they're very much, you know, one of the preferred orbits is going around the pole and back up again and, and like that around the Earth. And so as the Earth is spinning underneath, you can keep scanning it, you can keep sending information, you can keep doing different kinds of things. And so for these sort of satellites, you know, North Sea coast is perfect for launch because you've got clear sea all the way up to the North Pole. Um, and, and, and of course, you also have you know, relatively sparsely populated areas. So if something does go wrong, which, you know, safety has improved massively in the past years, but nonetheless, sometimes things do go wrong. Um, there's also, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no uh, danger to people. So the whole of Europe is waiting with a weighted breath to actually get these spaceports online so they uh, can bring their rockets and their satellites uh, to launch into space. Uh, yes, I have one very brief final question, but before that, I should just say, Bill has come back with a little note he says could you update scotland on the space map to include the orbex rocket factory in Forres? um yes I, we can definitely include orbex i mean to be fair that map is not is not just out of date but it's also a simplification um as, as all maps are um the, i i that 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 triangle map doesn't quite include the the, the space cluster down in prestwick in in ayrshire um, as I said, I've only pointed out some of the key locations for the space world, but there's also the one just off Campbelltown, the Canish. Um, there is, of course, the uh, the the Forest uh, Park where they are developing not just Orbex, but there's also other companies there. Tactical Wireless, very famously, which is a, which is a, a remote Wi-Fi distribution uh, company that uses space space and satellite assets. So there's quite a quite a few people there. There's also other pockets sort of in of development in between. There's research, very interesting planetary research being done in Stirling. Scotland, as small as it is, has way too many of these moving parts. You know, in, in, in Auburn, the Scottish Marine, Scottish Association for Marine Science is doing research with space assets and they are thinking about, you know, perhaps building and launching their own satellite. You know, the, the list is endless and any map that I will ever make is going to be immediately out of date. So good point, Bill, but, you know, we, we, we only can keep up as much as we can. I did a single word, a yes or a no. Would you recommend the space sector for young people for careers? Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and it's so diverse, you know, space really does need everybody. Uh, this sort of space, yes, of course, it needs a lot of scientists, engineers, a lot of sort of STEM professions, if you like, so that, you know, science, engineering, mathematics, um, and then, and then, and then sort of generally technology. Um, but it also needs um, artists, it also needs creatives. In fact, Scotland has one of the world's premier and first um, marketing agencies and, and business analytics agencies specifically for space called Astro Agency. Amazing team working very, very closely with many international organizations, space agencies, big companies, really great work they do. Um, it needs, you know, if you think about human space flight, it needs biomedical sciences, you know, the whole, the whole package there. Um, so everybody's welcome. And, and Scottish space story seems to, you know, we said there's quite a lot of history, but it does look like it's only the beginning of an even bigger history of a bigger story that's being written over the next few decades. Matthias, thank you warmly for a fascinating discussion. Our thanks to, to Swain and John, smoothing the way beautifully behind the scenes. Our thanks to our viewers. And we'll be back again in a week's time when our guest will be David Spaven, asking the question, was a dreadful mistake made in the 60s when so many railway lines were closed down? And could there be scope yet in new situations for a rail renaissance? In the meantime, our thanks again, Matthias, Swain, John, and viewers and goodbye for now.